introduction of myself. So I'm Mikhail Lindgren, I'm a partner at the uh, Bain Company, which some of you might know is a global consulting firm. Uh, I work as part of our manufacturing and operations practice. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've been working largely in, in industrial and advanced manufacturing on operations problem and optimization. In the last five years, that increasingly become about digital technology and how to integrate and incorporate that in a way that creates value. And today, I've just going to set the scene a little bit uh, around what are the key things we are seeing across all industrials, but also specifically tech manufacturing, and uh, have maybe a different perspective on the challenges that have been with some of your the latest speakers up here. And just one, one reflection uh, as I was writing out today. So the, the first time I got out to this part of the world was probably over 20 years ago in a different career in IT and telecom. It was the late 90s. Quite a different landscape, but as I reflected in the car, there's probably quite a few learnings from how we approach things then and what worked and frankly what didn't work in terms of driving innovation. So hopefully it's something that I'm finding that uh, my clients in manufacturing can learn a lot from and, and hopefully there's a few things here for everyone in the room. Before we start, uh, something I always do, and I'll do this briefly given the audience, I just want to make sure we define the word digital uh, before we get started too far down the line and you hopefully explain and see, see why it's important. The way we think about digital is really about uh, recombinant, recombinant innovation. So it's, a, uh, it's more than just the IT data and, and cool algorithms, although they are all cool. To give a bit of an example of what that means, think of something as simple as, as maps. Okay, for a long, long time, there were papers. Then we moved them onto a screen, but they were fairly dumb, and they were not just fairly live. We then incorporated, okay, let's connect these screens actually <coughs> onto a network and make it live and have an update form and optimizing route. And then at the moment, and who knows where we'll end, we're now overlay crowdsourcing and additional information to make it even more useful. Okay, so what's the point of that? I guess there's two, two points I'd like to, to make. <coughs> One is that the technology for each of these steps here are typically not new, groundbreaking, or looking exciting at, at the first glance. It's about making it useful, and it's integrated the old with the new that made a difference. That's point one. So don't expect, I guess, as you're listening to some of the experience change later on here, to always look for what's the shiny new thing. That's not necessarily where the value is. And the other part is about the part about the values. So even if the innovation can be quite small, the value is not necessarily linear. You can get a step change in value from doing something slightly different from before, and often, as we are seeing, re-attacking old problems, rather than necessarily saying, we've well, done that part of the supply chain, let's go somewhere else. Now, in the manufacturing, there's slightly uh, different technologies involved, but the same principle applies in terms of what technologies we're looking for to recombine from. So, same basic idea, different building blocks. Another point, and the word is certainly overused, is it about we are at an inflection point within manufacturing globally. And this idea of there's actually a massive change, and that change has not played through yet in terms of connectivity and connecting up our factories and plants. And obviously the reason many of plants are old, so this takes time. There's an exponential growth in how much sensors we're installing, how much data we are gathering. Even in high-tech manufacturing plants, as, as Anna mentioned, they're not necessarily always at high-tech in the way they do the product. The data we're collecting is growing very, very rapidly, and I'll share a few thoughts about how to think about that later on as well. And fortunately, computer power is increasing and the cost is coming down as well. What that means in the end, I guess, for, for manufacturing and operations, there are a couple of key themes that emerge so that we see coming back again and again. One is about smart automation. It's a lot about efficiency, speed, flexibility, the ability to customize and build something in the moment at a low cost. The other part is end-to-end -end flexibility across the supply chain, outside the four walls of a plant, including through reaching through into both of our customers, but also back up to our suppliers, enabling faster uh, cycle times, being much more able to do uh, make versus build decisions, because you don't necessarily need to build it to control information and know what state things are at. The next part is around the intelligent supply chain, and that's about feedback loops through the same supply chain, driving data back, all the way back to the R&D state. And uh, the ideas are typically been proven and uh, tried before, but things that are designed to value, designed to test, designed to manufacture, 
can all be done at a much, much higher scale. And scale is a key word we come back to actually making business cases behind this deck up. And finally, our employee base is changing as well. And that's a challenge, particularly in manufacturing, because we don't always have access to the employees we need. But they are getting better productivity, capabilities are getting improving, but also they're changing. There's different people. And depending on what factors we have, in the nature of safety is changing, and we can provide a very different work environment for our employees. Now, the good part is that this has moved in the last three, four years from being showcase examples where many companies had one or two examples investing behind it. The ROI was probably deeply negative, but it looked cool and it made a good news story. Now you see, by and large, across many industry sectors, that uh, these results actually are coming into scale and to coming to drive real value. Uh, and they're not necessarily always the most headline grabbing article, but on the other hand, it's really the real value. Now, going from all our type of industries into specifically the one we focus on today, if you're looking on tech value, the tech value chain, what's the opportunity set here? This is a summary that I put together out of work we've done the last sort of three to five years across tech. And I've defined tech reasonably broad as including things like auto parts and other electronics manufacturing, even though it might not be a consumer goods at the end. Uh, first of all, this is a summary of what the top opportunity we see across the value chain. You can't unfortunately add up all of them and say more than 100%. It would be nice, but it doesn't really work. I spoke about product design. A big focus here is about better product build, especially design to value, design to test. Uh, we have been able to do that uh, selectively in the past, with better information feeds and understanding what data we need and making sure that data is available to the people who need it, all the way back up the value chain we can take out a lot more opportunity, much more opportunity there, both in the cost of getting things wrong, frankly, but also cycle time and time to, time to market, time to launch. We can talk about examples in the work we've done is 50, 70% reduction in time to launch. Uh, we talk about planning from that, the forecasting accuracy, better understanding of how many, how, how many units do we need, when do we need them, where do we need them. Big opportunities feeding back the data, especially if we can connect our supply chain beyond the borders of our company we're working for. Sourcing, more on the procurement side, a lot of our standardization, reusing part, understanding what we have, what we can use, rather than uh, avoiding our engineers, although they like it, to go and select the new latest cool toy, rather than looking at what we actually have, what a cheaper alternative that might work just as well. And then we go into the four walls, I guess the core manufacturing. I've broken it up here, delivered into two parts, the normal sort of OEE meshes we always look at. One on the tooling side of time management, time utilization, so availability and uh, how well we use time when we're operating. Opportunities are consistently double digit, 20, 20 30%. Uh, in tech manufacturing, compared to other manufacturing, this is typically at the lower end. Availabilities of our plants, given the scale and expense of them, are typically quite well managed. There's a big opportunity utilization, setup time, change over time, and the driving cycle time after that, so not only asset utilization. But the big one, of course, is GIN, the quality of it. And tech, the tech supply chain specifically has a big, big opportunity or challenge, depending on which side of the fence you stand, given the number of steps involved. So if you're not only looking at the final assembly and the fallout there, you're looking at the steps between that and we add them all up, this gets cumulative or actually multiplicative. And the range of opportunity in the clients we see, and these are blue chip major organizations, some of you probably work for these organizations, right, and know these numbers, is up towards 40%. The 5% is more very stable production lines have been running product units for five, eight years plus. If we're looking at a lot of products we're actually producing, the yield, the yield loss we're having is very, very large. There's a cost component to that, but there's also a time to market component and how about the velocity of getting towards the customer. That's where we're seeing a lot of focus at the moment with the clients that I'm working with. Now, okay, that's great. Big opportunity. So what's the challenge? Why aren't we getting out of it? Why aren't we executing on this? And Anna mentioned some of that. I'll take a slightly different stance, probably. There are some really unique challenges in manufacturing operations compared to other industries that are trying to apply uh, 
digital technology and user data. A few of these ones are fairly basic, well known, but we tend to forget about them. We have really expensive assets, and they take a long time to build. So we need to be really sure when we build them that what we're building is going to work. So the tolerance and uncertainty before we commit to a plant design is much higher, which means we bring bringing forward the testing and getting comfort of what we're putting in place. Linked to that, the risk tolerance is low, especially in industries where we're working with large contract manufacturing. Those companies are not very keen to take a big risk on how to set up their plant and how to change it. That's all the strong industry structure, and you need to live with it and you need to manage it. The other part tends to get forgotten, I'll speak more about that now. That's the organizational and people side of things, where things frankly often get stuck. The technology is not always the problem. Most of our manufacturing executives, and I'm sure there are some in the room today as well, are not used to live in a world where problems are very highly cross-functional, high integration between the plant, the R&D team, marketing, or equally, uh, the pace of change that we kind of require them to go through. That's not how we set up and run them. We have encouraged them, and many are extremely good on projects <coughs> like Lean, that we've been running for the last 30 years, and we're doing it really, really well. That's the world that people are coming from. And now we're trying to ask them to do, like, how we're going to do some test and learn. It's not really how that works. It's a huge uncomfort, and it's a skill gap. And linked to that is that we are uh, seeing in manufacturing industry Specifically, you know, the community you're in around here. These are not always the jobs that attract top talent. It's hard to get traction. It's hard to get the factory or plant environment to be the place where young engineers and designers need to go. So, going a bit further on the organizational side, the challenge we are seeing that is holding back change and holding back success is this tension between what we call, what I would use the name of doers and dreamers. Doers are typically are the operationally focused expert, uh, or very often engineer, quite a few in this room, that sort of sees digital as the next tool, and very much focused on is it the right solution, is it the good solution, and looking at what do we do next. Think of the factory of tomorrow rather than the factory of the future. Against that we have dreamers, visionaries, and you probably look at them, see them up in executive board and boardrooms and so forth, be a bit out everywhere, marketing typically a good place to find. Can be cross-functional, no real industry discipline or functional discipline. These are typically the minds that are looking, okay, how can we evolution? How can we how can drive a step change? How can we do something totally different? How do we challenge what we're doing? How do we steal our basic and start from scratch? And you can probably sense that those two role types, and you probably can resonate with thinking about fueling organizations, that can create some challenges in terms of perspectives of what we should do and how we should do it. Now there are some best sort of practices slowly emerging how to think about how we coach depending on who we are here. We watch out some pitfalls for ourselves and we're camp we in, and I'm probably personally more in a camp or a doer, so it's in my checklist for myself, right? Uh, thinking about avoiding spending too much with perfection. The perfect solution, the over-engineer design, how do we move to getting out to do a test and trial and re recognizing that we're going to learn a lot we didn't even know to ask while actually doing a field trial. How do we set up our factories or our manufacturers to enable them to invest in doing these trials? Focusing on new things, be it new revenue, new technology, the latest thing, curse of the West Coast. We need to always remember back to focus on the return on investment of the investment maker. There's still are businesses we need to run. And what that often means in the entire the plant is we go back to the problems we addressed with lean because they're probably still the bottleneck, they're probably still the main part of the fallout, but we try to solve and get more value out of them. It's a very common when I engage sort of early stage with organizations to see really exciting programs, but they are absolutely everywhere. They are improving everything. Things that absolutely does not matter, and they maybe have some people against the really key value drivers. Understand what that is and be really focused. That is That gets lost, especially by the doers who are focusing on how can I improve this thing. Whether that, imp that thing really adds value or not is typically not their first concern. Against that, we have the dreamers who are more looking at how can we do things totally different. Challenges there is more about organization 
and again, sort of priorities, what, what vision do we go for? And what's the implication of doing that on very mundane things like our operating model, our organizations, capital funding, who has the decision right? Those things tend to get forgotten, and either because they're high tension, or things get stalled. You get to believe what I call the stalled transformation. And it's typically not because the ideas are wrong, but because it was never really designed for anticipating, oh, well, actually, there's a base business we need to run still, and it follows base business laws and governance processes that we need to hook into. The way we typically, the way I think, is when I think about combining these two, it's a quite simple idea. I hope it makes sense to you. First, working like a future back, so our dreamers. Understanding what are the big lighthouses, vision, beacon on the hill that really will make a difference in the plants and the factories we work in. Put them up on the edges here, so that's an aiming point. You need to have an aiming point, lighthouses are good. Then go future back. Start mapping back to actually the reality, the hard truth, and understand really, have an unvarnished view of what's the kind of performance, what's the capabilities, and build back into stepping stones. Each, and as you do that, you get each stepping stone, back to concepts of Agile, needs to have value in its own right. So building the foundation, make sure we can take, take us forward, but we're avoiding this, uh, okay, cross your fingers, or leap of faith. We're investing a large amount of money and time, and 12 months later, we hopefully it worked, or it didn't. So how do we break that? How do we modularize that? And a stepping stone, or maybe you take one step forward, and have to take one step back and go sideways again. So each step can't be too big, because then we can't fail. So we need to be able to allow ourselves to fail and learn if we want to move fast. And then prioritize and sequence the near-term investment against stepping stones that are quite close to you, but you know they're building towards something that you actually need and want. And you screened out a lot of really cool ideas that actually didn't add value to, to your supply chain or your manufacturing. And be really ruthless about focusing on value to start building a momentum for investment and improvements that then feeds and funds itself. And as you probably can appreciate, the challenge from an organization, therefore, is do you have an operating model and processes and an org structure and roles to execute something like that? Are you balancing the future, the near term, you take steps, you have to go to go backwards, forwards, you restep, and then you scale. That is not typically how manufacturing organizations are set up. And if you don't get in your operating model right, you will create tension, in organizational tension. And it's long before any technology holds you up, you're going to get stuck. And I just want to share one other aspect on the point of near-term value, group-term value. And it ties back to data, and Anna mentioned some stats on just also on the information we're collecting. This is a consideration that I think, in my experience, more people probably need to, to make. Think about the data you need versus the data you own. There's a little bit of analog I'm trying to make in the picture, so sometimes you miss the, the forest or all the trees. There are countless and countless, uh, countless of, uh, of clients and executives, the presentation about digital in operations and started talking about how much sensors they have, how much data they're collecting, and are they going to go out and really explore this data and answer all these interesting questions. That is not really a winning strategy. You might get lucky, but what you really need to think about is what is around. You need to go back to the basics, being clear about the value drivers in your supply chain, in your plant, what questions matter to you, therefore what data do you need, and then looking at can I triangulate that with existing information, which you often can, or can I selectively then censor up part of my manufacturing plant to help with those questions. <coughs> it, I guess from, it remains surprising to me, I guess, that we often get caught up with collecting lots of information and hoping a really smart AI algorithm will just solve it for us. And sometimes, especially in, uh, in, in manufacturing environments, we're collecting huge amounts of data. But it can be quite narrow and silos, so and lots of depths and time series for select parts. And we have nothing but steps in between. And again, going back to, if you look at the value driver being entry and visibility, that the fast feedback loop to flow through your supply chain, the moment you have a gap that, supply, that flow stops, 
So correcting that or rectifying that with a fairly crude solution typically makes a, a huge difference in the short term. Much more than adding more depth on the 10th level of a process that's already quite well understood and managed. That's been a reasonably quick wrap up. Uh, so I just want to summarize some key points that hopefully you can take with you from this today. So first of all, the opportunity is, is both very large and very real. Many times the actual driver isn't fundamentally different from what we have attacked the last 20 years. But the, our tools are different. And the way to work to deploy them is different. There are unique challenges in manufacturing. It's sometimes if you get carried away with other industries and sectors that can move faster, but they don't have the billion dollar asset bases that we all sit with and we are trying to manage. Capabilities, people, operating model is the key that will set the pace. Yes, technology clearly is important, but it's not sufficient. And I would say my, my personal assessment would be that technology is way ahead or maturity to execute. And if there's one thing I can leave you with as you think about taking the, this day forward into your organizations, don't lose sight on value. The basic laws of business still apply. Make sure we focus our uh, energy and, and our, uh, our excitement on the problems the overall business really cares about and not just the technical problem. On that note, thank you.